Well, today is September 7th, 2016, and we are interviewing Martin Coots at Tremont Ridge Assisted Living Facility. Martin is 85 years old, having been born on November 11th, 1930. My name is Sue Burkholder, and I will be the interviewer. And also in the room is Whitney Thornton from the Tremont Ridge facility. Martin, for your um, for the recording, can you please state what war and branch of service that you served in? Korea. Okay. Marines. Okay. Okay. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself, like where you were born and and your family, siblings, that type of thing? I was born in Shreveport, Louisiana. I have one sister, no brothers. Uh, she's two years older than I am. She also was born in Shreveport. Uh, we moved to Monroe in 1932 and been here ever since, uh, well, until 52 and when I went in the service. Okay. Did you have any other family in the service before you? No, my father didn't serve. I had cousins that were in the war, World War II, mm -hmm. but uh, my immediate family, I had no one in there. Okay. All right. And what what were you, uh, what was your occupation before entering the service? I was a sheet metal worker. Okay. My father had a shop and I worked for him. Uh, uh, that was the last job I had for one in the service. Okay. And how did your family feel about you going into the service? They didn't care too much about it. It was either, I mean, they didn't try to stop me, but they weren't too eager for me to leave home either. Sure. And uh, But I had, uh, I graduated from high school in 48, and in 49 I started receiving uh, letters from the draft board saying that I was eligible to be drafted, and I didn't want them to tell me where I was going to go. I wanted to make my own choice. Mm -hmm. So I thought I wanted to go in the Marines and I, and I did. I enlisted in Monroe, Louisiana and went all the way down to New Orleans to get sworn in. From New Orleans I went to South Carolina to basic training. Stayed there 11, 11 weeks. Then went all the way across to, to California for mountain training and cold weather training and left there and I believe it was July of 50, 51 and went right straight to Korea and that's the only service time I had was training. Well, oh I'm sorry. Um, how was basic training for you? Did you, I mean was it a shock? Uh, going in, uh, it, it was a shock. Yes, uh, I, I, it was more than I bargained for, mm -hmm. but I it was my I made my own mind up, and I was going to go ahead and finish it, whatever it took, and that's what I did. Mm -hmm. uh, I enjoyed it, but it, it wasn't the easiest that I could have had if I'd have joined the Navy or the Army or something like that. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that they had such rigorous training and boot camp as the Marines did. Mm -hmm. They were known for that and uh, they put us through it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Did did you have any memorable instructors? Uh, yes, I did. My boot camp sergeant was named Sergeant Sexton, S-E-X-T-O-N, mm -hmm. and he was a typical Marine sergeant. He was as tough as any of the rest of them. Mm -hmm. And he felt sorry for no one, mm -hmm. and uh, he had to put up with that every day. And how do you uh, do? You feel like that helped you to be? Oh, there? exactly. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. They they didn't do anything that I didn't gain from. Mm -hmm. I put it that way. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, did you meet any um, or make any friendships during basic training that lasted? And basic training, no. No. Okay. No. All right. And um, after basic training, did you go to advanced training? I went to California to advanced training, yes. And what was that for? Uh, it was mountainous 
just like Korea was going to be. Mm -hmm. It was cold. Uh, and we had to get in shape. That's what it was for, to get in shape climbing mountain. Because mm -hmm. that's all Korea was, was mountainous mm -hmm. terrain. Okay. Uh, that's about it. Okay. So after advanced training then, uh, where did you go? Oh, after did advanced you... training I went home for two weeks on a furlough and then I came back to California and left San Diego in July of 51 and went straight to, well I went to Japan first and then mm -hmm. to Korea. Okay. So when you arrived in Korea do you remember what you were thinking when you arrived or how you were feeling? Yes, I do. The first thing we did, we they put us in tents. And I saw the sunshine coming through. I looked up and there's bullet holes at the top of the tent. I wonder what in the world we're getting into, you know. Right here, just got off the boat and there's bullet holes everywhere. But that, it was, that was from the past. There wasn't uh, nothing going on at the time. But uh, from there, we were assigned to different units and it took us by truck for 10 miles up to the uh, starting of the war zone and we were assigned to different uh, companies then and uh, that's where I remained, okay. uh, Howe Company 3rd Battalion. And what was your what was your duty during that time? I was an infantryman, a rifleman, okay. yeah. That's all I was, was a, Rifleman. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I, I beg your pardon. I was there for six months, and I become the company clerk. The only thing that meant there was no patrols for me. I would stay in my area at night instead of going out on patrol, mm -hmm. which which was meant a lot. Mm -hmm. But uh, that was the only promotion I ever got was being a company clerk, okay. and I was a company clerk until the day I left. So, uh, it, it got me away from a lot of things that I had been going on, and it was a big relief, you know, I uh, mm -hmm. had it a lot easier, but mm -hmm. being the clerk, I would keep up with the KIAs, and the MIAs, and the WIAs, and stuff like that, and, and records, and uh, that was my job to keep up with that, and my personal company, just my company, mm -hmm. which was a job. So what was it like um, when compared to the training you had before you left and then when you got to Korea and you actually went out, Well, do you feel like it was a fair training? It was a fair training except for one thing, for the noise uh, and for the, uh, I don't know how to explain it, but uh, you always... Uh, you never knew what was coming up next. You uh, couldn't anticipate anything. It was always something new mm -hmm. and uh, loud, loud, and, and you, you got uh, or disoriented every time there was a firefight. You didn't know which way you come from or which way you're going to go. You know, mm -hmm. it was just a lot of bullets going off and bombs and mortars and things like that. It was uh, it's different than anything I'd ever witnessed. Mm -hmm. But and it never got any better. It was the same thing every time. Mm -hmm. yeah. And how did you feel during that time when when there was a firefight? How did I feel? Well, I just wanted to be the ones to walk off. Mm -hmm. uh, there wasn't too much feeling going on. Mm -hmm. You know, you just had to look out for yourself, and you had a buddy that you stayed with, and mm -hmm. you took care of him. He took care of you. Mm -hmm. So. About it. Um, so, I'm sure you witnessed casualties and destruction, and were there many casualties in your unit? Oh, yes, ma'am. What surprised me after I got out, a bunch of them were from St. Louis. Hmm. I still remember some of the names that were from St. Louis. And I need to go look up if they're still alive, but uh, I haven't done that. Uh, now, what was the question you asked me? Um, 
I asked if there were many casualties in your unit. Oh, yeah. How? Uh, yeah. We went on a patrol one time, 12 of us, and two of us walked back. So there was a bunch of, always a bunch of uh, mm -hmm. casualties. And uh, we had officers that were killed, enlisted men. Mm -hmm. It didn't make any difference what you were. If you got in the way, you got it, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and how did you deal with that? Well, this is all you could do is deal with it. Uh, you couldn't run high, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, you just had you had to take one day at a time, mm -hmm. and uh, you, you kind of got used to it. But you knew something was going to happen each day. But uh, there was nothing you could do about it. And you couldn't hide or not go mm -hmm. when they told you to go. You had to go. Sure. Yeah. Were you ever in um, a victim or a? Did you ever walk into an ambush? Uh, no. Uh, we went one night, it had snowed, uh, I guess, three feet deep, and it's still snowing. And we went out on a patrol, and the first thing you know, we were in enemy territory. Didn't know we'd gone through their front lines. Mm -hmm. So we had to hold hands to communicate. If you let go, you couldn't holler because you were in their territory. Mm -hmm. And uh, it would be easy to dislocate yourself. You, you'd be alone out there if you didn't hold hands. So we just made a circle and come back. Luckily, they didn't even know we had gone through them, and they would come back out, got in our uh, territory, and uh, nobody was shot or anything. We mm -hmm. just made a little circle through the end of the lines and mm -hmm. come back. Yeah. yeah. Are there other memorable occurrences or experiences that you can think of when you were out on patrol? Yes. Uh, this same story I was telling about 12 of us went out and two of us well to begin with uh, it was during the Penman Drum uh, era where they were having peace talks in Penman Drum and we could see maybe five or six miles out in front of us but it's a big valley and they had four balloons that would on each it marked the the uh, territory that was uh, basically uh, neutral and you, you could see the balloon walking the, and they had a big tent and there, everything went on in the news we we were right there could see it going on but uh, the, what, uh, things had slowed down uh, in other words we weren't going on patrols and they wasn't coming at us or anything but in the morning we'd get up we'd make coffee sit on top of our bones and talk Maybe some fellow from down the road would come talk to you, like I had a friend that did that. And uh, uh, the enemy would come out at night and dig a hole in between their lines and our lines. And the first thing you know, whenever we get up in the morning, talking and carrying on, they shoot one of them. So orders came from my battalion that, uh, uh, that there would be a patrol to go knock that machine gun nest out. And uh, unluckily enough, it was my patrol. And uh, we got up one morning, we had decided we was going to leave tomorrow morning. And when we woke up, it was just a thunder and a lightning and carrying on, which was to our favor because they mm -hmm. didn't figure we'd be moving in that kind of uh, weather, you know. So we went, instead of going straight out, we went down a piece and then went, we were going to go behind them. We got to the uh, machine gun nest that was up on a knoll, and we could hear them talking. And we got on our bellies, and we clawed up as close as we could. And you could see it at the tops of the heads moving and everything. You hear them talking. And one of the guys shot it, one of the uh, Koreans, and they started throwing hand grenades, pulling pins and throwing hand grenades all over the place because they were rolling down the hills, you know, and amongst all the people climbing the hill to get after him, and uh, there was 12 of us and uh, I, I forget the other guy's name but two of us survived it we killed all four of the people in the turret and we got ready to come back our sergeant was gone and everybody else was gone except he and I mm -hmm. so we had to make up our own decision which way we go back to our lines so we went to the right 
and we were moving along just as slow as we could and listening, thinking maybe we might be going into enemy territory, we might be going back to our lines we didn't know. And uh, we were walking along side by side, and I looked over and there was a, this sounds funny, but it's true, there was a Greek, a gook, sitting at the base of a tree with the rifle in his hand, his eyes wide open, teeth shining, with the rifle in his arm. So I hollered, get down. So we hit the ground, we turned around and shot at him. He, had already, he was already dead. Somebody had already shot him. But we didn't know. Uh -huh. And when, uh, I wanted to go over and get his rifle, but I was afraid to be booby trapped. So it was so obvious it was plain that he could have been booby trapped. So we let it go. And we decided we weren't going the right way. And all of a sudden I heard Koreans talking. And I said, oh, wait a minute, we're going the wrong way. And then they talked a little while, so we, we just laid there for a few minutes. Then I heard an American talk, and I recognized him as our gunnery sergeant. And uh, of course, they didn't make us, they didn't make us say I do. Anyhow, the Koreans that were talking were our interpreters in our company, but we couldn't tell who it was, you know. So we, we heard the gunner sergeant saying something like, uh, uh, said something about the ammunition. He didn't care about the ammunition being low. His coffee was cold. I'm sorry. It's okay. Well, who won? Let me get my. We knew we was going in the right direction then. So we went through, climbed through the barbed wire and everything, and got into our company, and it, it was the right place to be. So we won. Lucky that we guessed right in the first place. Yeah. I'm sorry, man. Sorry, I didn't want to do this. After I got back home, I, after several years, I got to realize, I said, was this true or was I dreaming? You know, I thought maybe I had a dream or something. So I remembered the boy's name and I run across his name and number and some information I had. And so I called him and he said, yeah, that's true. So it made me feel better, you know. Did you make any close friendships while you were in Korea? Oh, yeah. Uh, we had moved along the 38th parallel, and they were still talking about peace talks, and uh, it was still slow, and uh, there were no mortars coming in or anything. So one of my buddies that I had, I had they, would, they would come up with, uh, a priest would come up maybe once a month and go behind the lines and have mass. And I kept on meeting this fellow from my company, but not my platoon. And I got pretty friendly with him and uh, uh, that's how I met him was going to church. And uh, one morning I looked up and he was, it was about seven o'clock in the morning. And he was standing outside of my hole and said, well, I just come down to drink coffee with you. So I said, well, good. So we got to talk and I asked him, did he, had he written home lately? He said, no. He said, well, they can go back and write a letter when I get back. I said, well, I got some paper and pen and everything and uh, I go in and get it. So I went in, we had, excuse me, we had a foxhole 
that was made of timbers and, and sandbags and dirt. Excuse me. So I crawled in the, well that's it right there. I think I have a paper. That's it right there. I crawled in there and opened up my knapsack and got the paper out and he was sitting He was sitting over here, and they, and this, out of the clear blue sky, threw a mortar around in. I don't know if you know what a mortar is or not. They drop them in a tube, and it blows up in the air, and it comes down when it hits, it explodes, throws lead out. Well, it hit them about six foot in back of him, and knocked him in, in, into, the, into the hole, and on me. I was getting the paper and stuff out, and he, he fell right in my lap. Well, the blood was coming out the top of his head. I think I've told you all this before. So I got a bandage and put it on there, and it didn't do any good. It was coming from his brain, you know, it was pretty forceful. So I got another one and put it on top of it, and it stopped the spewing. But So I called for a corpsman. A corpsman come diving in there and wrapped him all up. And they told me that I was going to have to take him back to battalion, which was a mile or so behind the lines. And uh, they gave me four Korean, South Korean leather bearers with a stretcher, and we put him on there. They told me to go go down that trail and back to the lines. And we started off, and we went. Uh, they was carrying him, and I I had a rifle. I was behind them, and uh, we got about a mile down the trail, and we came to a a place that looked like an apple orchard had been, but had been bummed out. All the trees, the top level of them, was gone, and the enemy was on high ground. They could see us moving, and we could see them up there. And they started throwing in mortars. Well, it got so close that they, about 20 feet from these guys carrying the letter, they just dropped him. Just they didn't set him down. They dropped him, and they ran about 20 feet. And another round come in. They hit the ground. Well, when it stopped coming in, they got up and they wanted to go leave. They didn't want to come back. So I shot at their feet. I didn't want to shoot them because I couldn't carry the letter myself. Mm -hmm. So I shot at them and they laid back down. They got up and I, I told them, I said, Idiwa. Idiwa means come here in Korea. Yobo seo means I can't tell you what that means. That's a cuss word. <laughs> So they knew that I was serious. I told them to come back here. Mm -hmm. So they did. They come back and they picked up the stretcher. And by that time, I saw the helicopter go behind the, the, the uh, ridge. I knew where we was going then. So we uh, we carried him onto the helicopter. And you seen the helicopters with the body uh, bed on the tied on the mm -hmm. ski on the uh, you know the I don't know what they call them, but down at the bottom of the, of the helicopter. We set him in there. There was four Marines, a doctor, and an officer at the helicopter. And we tied him in there. And all the time, he was laying down flat, and he was moving his right leg like this. I figured it was just some kind of reaction from the thing. But uh, I stayed in the, in the uh, it was like a, mass unit for two nights and I went back to my company and the, the guy that he was in the hole with came down to talk to me he said did he give you my watch I said I didn't see a watch he didn't have a watch on me he said yeah he did it was around his ankle that's what he's trying to tell me that he had us but I, I didn't know it was kind of watch they just come out with a, a light that you push and you see what time and whenever at first whenever they had them on they would do like that to see what time was several of them got shot so they made us wear them on our ankles but we would just look down and press the button and look at it and tell what time it was there and that's what he's trying to do tell me that he had the boys watch I got a letter from uh, a corpsman in in uh, Massachusetts, that he was going through uh, 
but I don't know what you call it. He's getting well, and uh, I asked him, did he ever see a watch? And he said, well, he came to different places before he got to him. He did, didn't know. They probably took it off when he first landed, not knowing whose it was or cared. So we didn't get the watch back, but uh, I thought that was pretty funny. He was, all the time, I don't know how he stayed alive. He was just mass blood, you know. And when they dropped him, he just moaned, and that was it. I thought he had died then. But uh, he didn't. And uh, he was conscious enough all the time to try to let me know that that watch was there. Uh, he went to Japan, stayed there a few months, and then sent him, they sent him to Boston, where he where his home state. He went through rehabilitation there. I got some pictures that they sent to me of him going through therapy. And uh, last I know, he he told me where he was from, but. Uh, I didn't know where the place was. Anyhow, in the meantime, I was a civilian and we moved up here to St. Louis, I mean to Litchfield. And uh, one of my friends worked for the phone company that I went to church with. He told me he was going to get sent, the phone company was going to send him to uh, Boston. So I got to thinking, I said, well, if I give you a name, can you? Look it up on the computer and see if you can find him. I'll tell you where he said he lived. He, I, he said, yeah. That was Kenny West. Mm -hmm. And uh, so about three weeks later, I got a phone call. And he said, uh, I got your man. I said, you got my man? What are you talking about? He said, well, you gave me this name in town that uh, your friend lived in. And I, I got the address. So he had the phone number, too. So I called the phone number. And uh, this lady answered, so I asked her, was uh, was this uh, such and such a residence? Uh, she said, yes. I said, was he in Korea in, in 1951? She said, yes, he was. She said, who is this? I said, this is a man who was in the hole with him when he got shot. And there was a silence after that. So she came back home, she said, is this Bubba? And I, I wasn't called Bubba overseas. Uh, I had told my mother about him, and she got in touch with his mother, and my mother called me Bubba. And that's how they learned that my name was Bubba. It's kind of surprised me, you know. So she said, would you like to talk to him? I said, sure I would. She said, well, he, he, all he can do is mumble. He can't talk. He got his brain damage, you know. But... Uh, so I said, all right, so I, I talked to him. I talk, did most of the talking. He would say, uh-huh, 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 like that, you know. And we got to talking. She'd come back home and she said that he was tired. So I, I told him, well, I'll, I'll stay in touch with you. And uh, But he had five children, and uh, he lived up until two years ago. But he had moved to another town reason why I couldn't get in touch with him when I got out. He had moved to another town in, in Massachusetts, and uh, this guy found that out for me. I knew he was good on the computer, and that's why I asked him to do it, and he did it for me. And uh, So I called him every two or three months and just checked in with him. The last time I called, she said he was in the hospital, dehydrated. So I said, well, I'll call back in a couple of weeks. It was a month before I called back, and he had died. So they invited me to come up here, but I never did, I never did go. And that's, that's about, he's about the closest friend I, I made. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Well, when you were... Um When you were wrapping up your time in Korea, um, how did that come about that you left um, Korea? Well, uh, it was, uh, they had made up a mind that when you got over there, you was to serve at least a year. 
and I knew my time was coming up. So, uh, guys that were right at, got over there right ahead of me, they were already leaving, so I, I was preparing to leave. So I said, I'm going to take something home. I had a, a 45 caliber pistol that I bought from this guy, but I don't know what happened to it. I gave it away, I believe. But I was going to take a, uh, this is a funny story, uh, what we called, uh, what do we call it? It was a camouflage thing fit over your steel helmet. So I took it off the helmet and put it in my pocket. And whenever we left, we left by six by a big truck, you know, with a seat, two seats on the side, 12 men in there. And uh, of course, we, there was a line of trucks going out. And I stood up and I saw the truck stop, maybe three, four ahead of us. And they made them all get out and it looked like they were searching them. So I took my helmet and I threw it over the side. I didn't want them to catch that on me. But what it was, when I got up there, they were checking for DDT uh, uh, license. Uh, <laughs> that's all it was. So I, did, I didn't get that home. Uh, that's about the only thing I was going to bring home was that. I didn't bring it home. Okay, so you were leaving, and um, then how did you come home to America? Well, we stayed on the trucks for the rest of the day, and we went to Pusan, which is the seaport, and we boarded uh, LSVs and went out to a ship in the harbor. We went from there to Japan, and from Japan we sailed and all the way to San Diego, and I got discharged in San Diego. I was offered a chance to become a sergeant if I wanted to stay over, but I told them I, I, I wouldn't take a general in no. I didn't want none of that anymore because there was a chance I'd be sent back over there and I didn't want that. Mm -hmm. So I got discharged in San Diego. Hitchhike all the way back home from California to Louisiana. So when you when you were home, how did you handle switching your mindset from combat and war to being back home? Well, funny thing, on the way back on ship, there was some real crazy guys on there. We'd be sitting on a fantail in the back in the evening in the sun, you know, and somebody'd holler, incoming. Everybody hit the deck. <laughs> Crazy things like that. You, you really never got over the experience like that, but I made it home, and uh, I, I don't know, it, it came easy. I went to work with my dad, and uh, I stayed there two years, maybe. And the funny thing, uh, one of my friends uh, graduated from high school, started work with a phone company. He would come by every once in a while and see me at my house. And uh, one day he come by and said, how would you like a job with a phone company? I said, well, I got a job. He said, yeah, but this is a good job. So I said, well, give me the information. So I went and took the information and went up to the phone company and took the test and passed the test. And I stayed with them 34 years and uh, enjoyed it. It was a good job. I was glad that I had the chance to get away from I, I I could go to work or I could stay at home to make a difference with my dad and I wasn't I wasn't going to get anywhere in the sheet metal business just mm -hmm. put in eight hours a day and get paid and that was all I was never going to get advancement because I wasn't that interested in it you know it was just a job mm -hmm. so I was glad that uh, I did get an offering to do something better for my life and that turned out to be pretty good. And did you, um, have you used military benefits since you've been out? Yes. Uh, I went to sheet metal school when I first got out. I took some, a few courses in sheet metal works. And then, like I said, I didn't use them. I, I had them, but I, I didn't use them. I was sort of like the shop woman. 
I run the shop and uh, if somebody come in and wanted some duck work made, I'd make it for them. And, uh, easy jobs like that, you know, I didn't put myself forward to do anything, to learn anything. Uh, my dad was easy on me, he didn't want to force me to do anything that I didn't want to do and that wasn't too good. I, it wasn't like a real boss, he was more like a friend, you know. Did you join any veterans organizations? Uh, yes. Uh, I drove a, a van for the DAV for five years, taking veterans to the hospital, 100 miles away in Shreveport, Louisiana, from Monroe to Shreveport. And uh, I, I, once a week, I'd, I'd go make that trip and take them over there. Uh, one day, and most of them were black and psychiatric. They were going to the psychiatric uh, part of the hospital. One day I was traveling down the Highway 80, which is the main highway from town to town, and there was a 18-wheeler with a trailer on the back of it. And he was pretty slow, and I was, we was in a hurry. So I said, well, I'm going to pass him up. So I went around as soon as I found it clear and got up even with the cab. This guy was in the cab. He had a monkey uh, <laughs> monkey face on. He would, he would wave like <laughs> the funniest thing you ever saw. And this boy up in the front seat said, don't tell my doctor I said that. <laughs> so I said, <laughs> he locked me up. That was the funniest thing I ever saw. Oh, goodness. Well, uh, how do you feel that your service and experiences while in the service have affected your life? Uh, well, I decided I was going to go through with it, and I did. And uh, it taught me to tackle things that I n normally wouldn't do, you know, not to uh, start something and not finish it. Uh, it wasn't too much I'd do about not finishing it, but because I had, once you signed your, your name, you had to complete it. But uh, I think that it made a better man out of me in that respect. Uh, when I started something, I wanted to go ahead and finish it. So, that's it. And um, were there life lessons that you learned because of your military service? Uh, Whenever you're given the assignment to do something and uh, you have to try your best to complete it. In other words, uh, they assigned me another person in my hole, in this hole. There was, no, was two of us in there. This, I was just by myself when his picture was taken. He had gotten wounded. Uh, you had to do your best to protect yourself and your, your friend that you was assigned to to uh, stay with and uh, I feel like uh, both of us had to have the same uh, mindset that uh, it was our, our responsibility you were my responsibility I was your responsibility so uh, it helped me out a lot that way could have just been by myself and said, the heck with you, you know, you look out for yourself, but uh, it wasn't that way. Do you, um, how did your military experience influence your thinking about war and then the military in general? Well, war is no good, no good at all. If I had to deal with, I don't think I would join the Marines because you're just a number with them. Uh, they don't care whether you live or you die. Just so long as you shoot your rifle and kill the enemy, that's all they want, you know. Uh, and there's some parts of the Marines that's not, not like that. They had a, uh, but I was just unlucky enough to get into the 
infantry to begin with, and that was the toughest part that I know of. I could have been stationed somewhere in Hawaii or someplace like that and really enjoyed it, but I didn't. I was only hoping to get out every day, and uh, that was the difference. Okay. Uh, would you like to tell us about the remaining pictures you have? This was, uh, I don't know whether it was my first or second one. This, it was so cold, you see the snow on the ground. They had us lined up, it was about 20 or 30 getting purple hearts. Oh, excuse me. That's fine. They were passing out like flies. It was so cold, it was several of them passed out during the ceremony. And uh, I don't remember what the temperature was, but it was plenty cold. You can tell by the, the background there. The other one was a month, just a month later, and you see the difference in the weather. I got that. Uh, it was pretty nice. Uh, there's two different colonels there presenting the, the uh, citations. Mm -hmm. And this was pretty pleasant, but this was really bad. They rapped about it quite a bit. And what were those purple hearts for? For wounds. Wounds, okay. Yeah. Okay. The first one was the hand grenade and the like I was telling you, they're throwing them down the hill and they're rolling alongside of it and mm -hmm. explode. And the second one was a mortar round whenever my buddy got hit and I got hit at the same time. Uh, and my bunker. This is just uh, an award that the United States government sent that to uh, verify that I had been wounded and they sent it to my home. I didn't send it to me. This was the picture I took when I first got to California from South Carolina. Uh, they made us take pictures. It's the first thing. Mm -hmm. uh, that's about it, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. And your marine flag behind you? Yeah, I bought this in this field several years ago and it's been in a drawer ever since I bought it. So this lady asked me, so why don't you put it on the wall? And I said, no, it's too big to put on the wall. She said, no, you go ahead and do it. So I had an American flag, same size, and I put American flag on one side. And I have a, I hunt a bit. I used to hunt quite a bit. And I've got a deer mounted. I had him in Litchfield at her basement. She said, why don't you put your deer there? I said, no, I don't want no deer in my, on my wall. She said, yeah, bring it. So I put it in the middle of two flags and she thought it was funny. <laughs> <clears throat> oh, goodness. Well, do you have any last comments that you would like to share? No. Uh, it might sound like I was running down the Marine Corps, but I, I wouldn't. I, I wouldn't join anything but that. But I, I wouldn't want to go back into combat like I'm mm -hmm. not knowing about anything, you know. Uh, it's good. It's a good branch, and uh, I could have had a better time, but I didn't. So can't cry over spilled milk. Uh, is there anything that you would say to somebody who might see or hear your interview in the future, a young person? Is there anything you would say to them? No, I just think about it before you join the Marines, mm -hmm. that it's a possibility you might go through the same thing, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Uh, I wish I'd have had more time to think about it and investigate it a little bit more, but I didn't. I was fixing to get drafted, and I, I went ahead and joined uh, as quick as I could. And my mother hated that recruiting sergeant. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, um, Bubba, I want to thank you so much for your time, taking time to do this interview. Thank and you. I do thank you so much for your service to our country. Thank you, ma'am. You're welcome.